Here we go. Hey everybody, I'm James from Reefs.com and we're here with Craig Bingham, Dr. Craig Bingham, who just finished up a lecture on uh, reef chemistry at the Manhattan Reef Swap, the 2011 Frag Swap. And, uh, welcome, thank you very much for uh, thanks, speaking with thanks us. For inviting me. So I was, excellent. I was hoping that you could give everybody at home who didn't get a chance to see your lecture a brief recap of maybe some key points of your lecture. Yeah, so I, I talked a little bit about um, how we might be informed on how to keep a, keep a good reef aquarium by examining some, some parameters that are as, as they're found in the ocean, like temperature, salinity, different nutrients. Um, the next part of the talk was about how seawater is constructed, the building blocks of seawater, the different kinds of ions that are in it, um, and, and how what, what the origin is of, of, of alkalinity or buffering capacity in seawater. Um, the next part of the talk was a little bit more interactive. We, the audience and I had a discussion about uh, what kind of parameters people are actually testing for in their systems and what, what's the most needed parameters that, that people really need to watch. Um, my suggestion was that, that people should use a, an alkalinity test kit. That if you only have one test kit for a reef aquarium, it should be a really good alkalinity test kit. And then some of the other parameters like uh, calcium and, and nutrients as well uh, that, that people might want to test for. Uh, and, and also, I guess equally with alkalinity, is some really precision way to measure salinity in the system. That could be a refractometer or an electronic meter. Um, and the last part of the talk was really about maintaining calcium and alkalinity in the system. Um, it turns out that the calcification is one of the dominant processes that happens in a reef tank. Um, it's really uh, up there with gas exchange and photosynthesis in terms of being, you know, the dominant process that occurs in a reef aquarium. And that catches some awkwardness by surprise when they set up a system and it's asking for more calcium and alkalinity than they're prepared to supply. So um, there's a predictive model for, for making a within a factor of two gas of how much calcium and alkalinity support an aquarium is going to need. Um, we applied that model to some model systems and we saw that uh, a reference 180 gallon system, fairly typical, half loaded with corals, uh, would go through 14 and a half pounds of, of calcium and carbonate equivalent per year. Um, and we also looked at, at how what, what that means in terms of how much of the alkalinity in the system is lost per day. And for that system, over half of the alkalinity is actually stripped out of the water by corals by every single day. <clears throat> so. Well, it was a really, really interesting uh, lecture. And I think that uh, everybody that was there hopefully learned something. I feel like um, you, you as an academic brought it down to the hobbyist level in a way that people understood. Did you, well, thank you. Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> I tried to, yeah. because yeah, I've read some. The, in the 90s and in, in the late 90s, I did a lot of aquarium lectures, and uh, you know, I think communicating with people is, that's the whole point of giving the talk, right? So if, if, uh, if the audience walks away kind of scratching their heads, then I haven't done a very good job of, uh, of reaching the audience. Awesome. Well, uh, one last thing. You said you've been, you've been in the hobby all, all along, but right. you've not been on the lecture circuit for right. the past almost 10 years. Right. Uh, have you noticed any, uh, this is your first one back, so it might be early, but have you uh, noticed any changes in the, in the hobby? So I think, uh, I, I think the foundations for, for um, creating successful reef tanks were really set by about the year 2000. I think that we understood the chemistry, I think that we had a basic understanding for what was required in terms of lighting. Um, what I've seen subsequently are uh, really technical refinements in how to deliver those to actual reef systems. So the LED lighting is obviously uh, was not technically feasible, you know, at 2000. It was certainly on the horizon, but it wasn't there yet. Um, so the sophistication of, of delivering lighting to systems. Um, to some degree, there have been some tune-ups in calcium and alkalinity. Uh, people seem to be kind of catching up with uh, the idea of, of adding organic carbon sources to, to reef tanks. 
and uh, with some thrills and chills with the with the newer kinds of solid media that, that people are using to varying varying degrees of success, right? Um, but all that stuff, the origins of all those things are really rooted in kind of the late late 90s uh, by 2000, and and the other thing that's different now is uh, uh, the, the degree to which it's possible to stock a system with completely mariculture or, or aquaculture specimens, which was something that we wanted to do, and, and now it's really possible to do it that. Seem, it seems like every year system, we're right? getting, a, getting new That's right. aquaculture That's right. uh, fish. Yeah, I think that the aquaculture fish and the, you know, the, the live rock and the, and the corals that are, that are produced in sustainable ways are, are critical for the future of the hobby because they kind of immunize us against fairly powerful forces that would really like to shut down the, the marine Smart aquarium robot. Yep. society. So, um, uh, and, and the extent that people buy into that now um, makes it more likely that the hobby will continue in a, a kind of vibrant way in the future, even if you know there are additional restrictions that are placed on our ability to, to obtain specimens from Awesome. Listen, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank and, you for uh, having me. It's been I hope a lot to see you at Mathna. Okay. All right. Thank you.